But first, a disclaimer from Mayor Grayson regarding the opinions presented on the Going Nowhere podcast. It has come to my attention that this show has resulted in harmful actions done to people and property in nowhere. There have been many dangerous stunts done in this podcast. Damage done to public property, trespassing, even though it was proven that episode 5, entitled The Neighbors, doesn't technically violate Indiana's eavesdropping laws. The Nowhere Historical Society and Nowhere Radio Station will be removing their partnership with Meg Bliss to produce this podcast should anything else go wrong which should hopefully assuage any fears of nowhere citizens may have of further damage. Any opinions given or actions taken during this podcast are that of an individual and do not reflect that of either entity. Hopefully, we will see more reporting from now on and less of this frill and fluff that has typically pervaded Miss Bliss's work. And yes, Meg, you do have to air this. Going Nowhere. Episode 8. Start. Stop. I'm sure at some point you've heard of the Sirens. They're creatures that have stubbornly held their place in our legends for centuries. Ironic, given they use song and story to ensnare their victims. I used to wonder what exactly they sang about that was so enticing. Love or lust, but some people prefer neither. Security? Comfort? Rest? Do we all just have something satiable that can be used against us? Or maybe they sang of something else. A great, stirring ball of something unknowable to us. Told not in words, but in feelings. Language, after all, is an entirely human creation. The siren song pours into the listener's ears as it overwhelms their body with something greater than themselves. And this greater thing would sit in a little pocket of their head, and when the listener would fall asleep, they would hear the song. Again and again it came every night, a ceaseless beckoning. The listener searched for an explanation to describe what they felt. Their tongue stopped short of forming the necessary words, and instead, they began to hum the siren's song. The listener searched for the lyrics and found nothing. The song was clever, you see, and knew how to stay its melodically unexisted self. The listener searched as the song consumed her whole, and though she did wish she had never even heard it in the first place, a small part of her considered that the way to understand was to become the song, to feel its rhythm played in her bones and to open her mouth and hear its notes that are not notes soar from her lips. Whether it was defined pushed away or accepted with open arms, the song cannot be destroyed. It cannot be searched for. And I can't stop hearing it everywhere I go. Hey Meg, it looks like your theory about the cellar of the museum being part of the old foundation was correct. I finally had the closing shift last night, so I went down and... Oh. Sorry. It, it's I it's didn't realize fine. you were recording. Uh, do you want to get some coffee in the kitchen? Your mum said I'll I could probably just come be in. like 20 minutes. Right, right, cool. <laughs> Sorry oh, again. Don't apologize. Oh, it's 
close this door. Okay. Back to the episode. Focus on the episode. Those bound to the siren's song fell into a seemingly inescapable trap. But every trap is meant to be tested. It just takes the right person to truly escape the inevitable. The following is a series of letters between Absalon Edwards and Gabrielle Molina. The odd duo of a well-off man recently emigrated from London and an ex-cowboy, or vaquero, who came to nowhere from Arizona after he lost his job. Bound together by their strife, the two wrote often to one another, until Absalon's unfortunate death in the midsummer of 1891. The first letter, from Absalon to Gabrielle, written the 21st of February, 1891. Dearest Gabriel, I apologize first and foremost for the delay in my writing to you. As of late, I have become forgetful. For the past several weeks, it appears I have got the morbs, but the least I can do was write to you a letter with an update on my health. While no physical ailment ravages my body, it has become harder and harder for me to rise in the morning often staying in bed until I had mere hours of sunlight left to enjoy, if I could even enjoy them. I find no joy in food, or clothes, fineries, or simplicities. It is as if the world has lost its color. What's wrong with me, Gabrielle? This has begun to feel more and more like the start of numbered days. My best to your health and happiness. Cordially yours, Absalon Edwards. The 24th of February, 1891. My dear Absalon, I'm sorry to hear of your declining health. It seems your nerves have done you in again. This isn't a strange happening. You've written to me before describing a nearly identical sickness of the mind. Perhaps your imbalance is caused so frequently by the pressure of having to bat away the affections of many handsome men for so long, especially since you seem to fall for each and every one of them. Thank you for your concern towards my person. It has been a lonely few weeks as I have picked up odd jobs here and there. I should soon find the ground under my feet again. When that happens, I may come visit you. We will get you up and outside again. Fresh air and a walk amongst the open fields can do wonders. All my best to yourself, Gabrielle Molina. The 3rd of March, 1891. Dearest Gabrielle, I apologize once more for my delay in writing to you, but I certainly concur with your conclusion regarding the stressors in my life. Oh, you do not have this plight. What a blessing that must be, not to have romantic flights of fancy or urges for any other. To not let the stress consume you so you must lie down for a moment merely when a pretty young gentleman opens the door for you. To not be me. He whose brow cools with sweat, breaking with the weight of life pushed upon my shoulders. To not always see the eminent countdown ahead, where we are a clock still on its minute hand, marching forward, looking backwards. Time lost can never be time gained, and there is such fleeting time on our march around the clock face. A visit of yours would be delightful. Do write to me at the earliest convenience of your availability. Cordially yours. Absalon Edwards. 7th of March, 1891. Dear friend, it's good to hear that you haven't crossed over just yet. While you are pitying yourself and wishing for us to trade lives, may I offer you this short reminder. 
Had I not moved to nowhere, my family would have wagged their tongues about my marrying until it fell out of their mouths. Even still, in nowhere, I feel as though I am always justifying why I remain a bachelor. No partner I had or will have has understood that I may feel for them, but not romantically. Still, I do pity your illness. A fear of clocks. Only time can tell what will come of that, eh? <laughs> Once again, I reassure you that you have many years left to live on this plane, and I beg that you try to relax for some of them. I can be around in the next few days. I seldom have days off now, except for Sunday. All of my best to you, Gabrielle Molina. 8th of March. 1891. Dearest Gabriel, you do not understand. May this letter find you in a better condition than the one I face. Death himself has begun to call on me. I noticed him as I was reading your letter, sitting in my day parlor as I stared out at the wilderness of nowhere beyond. There he was in the distance, a figure shrouded in darkest black walking amongst the silhouettes of tree trunks. It felt as though I was observing a moving painting. He was so, so far out that I could not be sure he was even real. A chill had begun to set over me, and I promptly had to lie down in my room for the rest of the evening. Then, the next morning there he was, still walking but close enough that I can make out the vague gait and build of your average man. He keeps getting closer. I am unsure of what to do. I write to you from my day parlor where I see him now. Gabriel, he has almost crossed the threshold of the forest, and he will not stop walking. Walking. At least I believe towards me. You need not visit. I think I will go away for a while. I had not seen him this close since... London. Forever yours, Absalon Edwards. 10th of March, 1891. Dearest Absalon, your last letter has caused me great concern. How can you be so sure that this vision is real? We all fear the inevitable end we march to. I understand certain parts of your past have brought you to face that specter you call death, as have many residents of our home. Age comes to all of us, but you still have life left to live. There is no specter Absalom. This poetic language has made you believe you are a character in a farce of your own life. My best to your health, Gabrielle Molina. 12th of March, 1891. Dear Gabrielle, Again, if I could make myself any more clear, one might be able to use me as a window pane. Poetry Plays they do not suit to describe what is happening to me. He is getting closer. He comes. Not at a run, though he knows he is slow. But he will find me. I have begun packing up my belongings. I will stay the night somewhere across town. From there, I do not know but hopefully it will delay him enough. That is a lie. I know it will do no good, but I will do it anyway. It is all I can do, after all. Forever yours, Absalon Edwards. 14th of March, 1891. Dearest Absalon, these letters only grow my concern. 
Please, have someone stay with you rather than move completely. If I cannot convince you that it's for your own health, then at least so you can understand what exactly this vision is. A fresh set of eyes will provide new perspective. I myself will attend to you if needed. As of late, it hasn't been difficult to find work. I've secured a job at the local cemetery, and was provided late working hours in which I roam the graveyards alone. I can assure you that the Angel of Death has not walked on Earth, or I would have seen them. Once again, my best to your health. Your dearest friend, Gabrielle Molina. 16th of March, 1891. Dearest Gabrielle, while I appreciate the generosity of your offer to stay with me, I find little comfort that you are so aligned with the figure that torments me. Regardless, I have begun staying with my employer for the time being. Just as the clock hand struck, it seems. I sent a girl there to fetch my remaining belongings, and she reported back that all the foliage on the property, previously overgrown in vivid green, had withered. I kept few livestock, as it was difficult to tend to them myself, but I did feed them well. They should not have been found malnourished, and just as dried out as the rest of all that was once living. So tell me again that I imagined it all. Tell me once again, with your full heart bleeding the words as ink on paper, that death is not on its march towards me, and that it does not care what it leaves behind. Yours sincerely, Absalon Edwards. 18th of March, 1891. Dear Absalon, I'm at a loss as to a response for your previous letter. I made the journey to your home soon after receiving word from you. What I've seen, it nearly speaks to something out of the occult. What have you been doing, Absalon? What have you gotten yourself into? Sincerely yours, Gabrielle Molina. 20th of March, 1891. Dear Gabrielle, I do not take kindly to that accusation. It is defamation that you even considered I would involve myself with something like that. As cruel as God has been to me, I still pray. And I am not so weak-minded as to think challenging the supernatural would work in my favor. I only watch. There was a large window facing the direction I came. And I perch there, feeling as though all I can do is watch as he approaches, a helpless, pinned thing. He carves a path towards me, like a knife slowly digging through hardened soil. Be warned, he is close to the Carter's home. My wishes to your health and safety. Absalon Edwards. 22nd of March, 1891. Dearest Absalon, I'm sorry to have falsely accused you. However, you must admit that this is uncanny. Are you sure you've had no part in the events transpiring? For reference, the eldest Carter, widowed nearly twenty years, has died. The night before I write to you. I heard it from the Undertaker himself. Absalom, be careful. Best wishes, Gabrielle Molina. 25th of March, 
1891. Dear Gabrielle, I do not take it lightly that you would care to think I am a part of this. Are you not my closest friend? Do you not know my character the most, out of any living person in nowhere? I hope this response finds you in good health, but nothing more than good. Sincerely yours, Absalon Edwards. 27th of March, 1891. Dearest Absalon, again, my apologies. I don't mean to upset you with my words. I hope you can forgive me. May we continue our correspondence. I viewed both the late Carter widow and the body of the recently deceased school teacher, as it has come under the care of the church to give them a proper Christian burial. Both of which seem to share similarities with the disease that struck your property. Skin sagging, pulled taut in the areas where it's thinnest, so bone bulges out. Visible decay, despite being recovered shortly after their departures. What most concerns me is that their houses lay in a straight path towards where you are staying. Take care of yourself, Absalom. Best wishes, Gabrielle Molina. 2nd of April, 1891. Dearest friend, I hope this letter finds you in a better state than I am in. Due to some circumstance, some trick of fate or joke God has played upon me, I seem to not be able to leave nowhere. Every time I try to escape the woods, I just come back out again. Every time I set across the fields, I end up on one of the farms, politely being asked to return home. Why will it not let me leave? I can only run for so long, before everyone in the town is dead and I'm solely to blame. My best wishes to your safety. Absalon Edwards 14th of April, 1891. Dearest Gabriel, I have made a grave error. While sitting at the window of the boarding house, I briefly fainted and woke up to a sore neck and a terrible sight. He was there, staring at me from the other side of the glass window pane. If you do not understand the fear with which I write this letter to you, do consider that I have stared into death's milk-white eyes, but he did not reach for me. Why did he not try to take me where I lay, already poised for his grip? He wants me to keep running. I am sure of it. The hunter never enjoys its catch as much as it enjoys the feeling of a chase. But oh, why me? Why must I come so close to something that better men succumb to? Men who have families left behind lives that they have done so much more with than sit at home and waste away, forever fatigued and forever ill. I do not ask for an honorable death. I know I do not deserve that. But so many men have been in my place and felt that cold hand stretch out to them. So why does he decide to torment me? To chase me instead of just letting me take what I am due? Forever yours, Absalon Edwards. 17th of April, 1891. Dearest friend, the contents of your last letter disturb me to my core. Be careful what you summon into your life. If it's at all helpful, do remember that you have a close friend who does care whether you live to see another day. My best wishes for your health and happiness. Gabrielle Molina 20th of April, 1891 
Dear Gabrielle, It is best if I remain alone, then. There is nothing further to be gained by this conversation. Regards, Absalon Edwards. 24th of April, 1891. Dearest friend, I hope this letter finds you in good health, and better spirit than you were when I attempted to visit you. As you have dodged around from place to place, I've been looking into the recent destruction, following a clear path around nowhere. They all share remarkably similar causes of death. I've recently learned the term mummified, which may be better suited to describing them. Please write back to me soon, so we may further discuss the developments of the situation. With appreciation, Gabrielle Molina 30th of April, 1891 Dearest friend, I have not heard back from you since my last letter. There was word that you moved once again, and I found myself burying another body. They are becoming more frequent. All of my clothes seem soiled with graveyard dirt. Consider, my friend, what may happen if you come face to face with him again. Will he give you a second chance? Is this a hunt that never ends, as you assumed? Please write back. It's easier to evaluate this situation with an inside perspective than continue to clean up what's left behind. I apologize for any offense I may have caused you. With regards, Gabrielle Molina. 13th of May, 1891. Dearest friend, I'm trying one last time to reach you. Since you have shut yourself off from the rest of nowhere, I've been hoping you would send a letter to your old friend. This is the nature of this message. No mention of anything except friendship, which I am extending an arm of. I would just like to know how my friend is doing. Please write back soon. My best to your health and happiness. Gabrielle Molina 10th of July, 1891 My dearest Gabrielle, I do appreciate your efforts to keep in touch, to provide support and your well wishes. You are a better man than I ever could be. This will be my last letter. That I know. As illness, time, and my nerves have overtaken me, I can no longer run. When did I start running? I suppose I could not really say. It may have been my entire life, and we are born only to start our race towards the end. Though, I never have been a philosopher, Gabrielle. You know that. No. I know when this began. That dread house back in London. I still dream about it, in the few nights when I can sleep. Had I known the rot ate through the wood of our roof, had I known the stove was worse than I feared, I would have given Ma the money to fix it. The moment I had crested the hill to return home, ash began to burn my eyes. Acrid smoke and bright flames dizzied me, but I know what I saw. Standing in that inferno, completely untouched. Even that pale figure that caused my throat to close with bile as I understood what fate had given me is nothing compared to what I now face. Close to the threshold of this empty shed I have chosen as my hill to well, I 
I came to nowhere as the last in my bloodline. And now I will die here. Thousands of miles away from the graves of my mother, my father, my sisters, and my brother. Here, my march ends. Constant march. Right foot after left foot, and again in a rhythmic pattern. Away from the robed specter that has chased me now for several months. My movement has worn spiral lines in the grass of nowhere. And I suppose the running will only stop along with my heart. If he does not care to take me, I will implore him to do so until my request is granted. I deserve no third chance, regardless of his wishes to continue watching me run. Do retrieve my body after you read this letter, dear Gabriel. May I request, since I have no next of kin, that I am laid to rest underneath the tulip tree in St. Gemma's. Good night, Gabriel, and goodbye. Cordially yours, Absalon Edwards. Going Nowhere is a weekly mystery podcast produced by the Nowhere Radio Station. In this week's episode, Mayor Grayson was played by David Cook. Ellie Novak was played by Elizabeth Plant. Make sure to subscribe to catch the next episode. Rate and review us on iTunes, or leave us a like. Your support genuinely helps. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the Nowhere Radio. Visit our Twitter for a link to our Discord community. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.